Back in 2019, we released a two-part episode on Xing Yi Xuan Kung Fu, and we did this as a collaboration with good friend C. Fu Jonathan Blue Scene. It was a fantastic experience. You know, I personally learned a lot. I think we got a lot of great insight into the art. So what we're doing today is, you know, it's been a few years, so we're taking another look back at it. We're taking both episodes, put it in together in this compilation, and at the end, I'm going to offer a commentary from my point of view a couple years later, and how maybe I would even implement some of these techniques and these concepts into my own art of Kempo. So, ladies and gentlemen... We now present to you the history of what is Xing Yixuan Kung Fu. Hey everyone, and welcome to our very first episode that actually dives into the Chinese martial arts. Now a while back, we released an episode called What is Kung Fu? And that set up a series of Kung Fu videos to follow. If you have not seen that one yet, I definitely encourage you to do so if you want to get a rundown of what defines Kung Fu, the terminology, philosophy, and distinguishing features of the systems. Today, we are adding the first art to that playlist with a two-part episode on Xing Yi Twin. Now, I want to thank scholar and Shifu, Jonathan Bluestein, who provided us with the research and presentation of his art, and we're going to use our platform here today to share it with all of you. Now, I also apologize to Shifu Bluestein ahead of time for my attempt at the Chinese words. I promise I'm going to do my best. So we now present to you part one of What is Xing Yi Twin? Now this episode is going to be broken up into two parts. Today we're going to focus primarily on the history and theory of the art, and in the next episode we'll dive into the curriculum, movements, and methods in combat. So when and where did Xing Yi Chuen start? Legend has it that Xing Yi Chuen came down to us from the famous Chinese general Yue Fei. Famous and renowned in Chinese history, Yue Fei was one of the nation's greatest generals who lived in the 12th century. Now, it's common in Chinese culture that when a wonderful art or skill is created, it is attributed to a great man of the past, as the creator himself is too modest to assume ownership, or otherwise to glorify what was created and give both it and the ancestor more credit. Now, either way, there's really unfortunately no evidence that Xing Yi Chuen actually came from General Yue Fei, but he is still commonly considered the founder of the art, even though this continues to be disputed today. In truth, Xing Yi Chuen is a martial art which came to us from an ethnic minority. Now, when you have a country that has a large mix of minorities, you often wind up with such a wonderful mix of culture, cuisine, traditions, and so is the case in the Chinese martial arts, where Chinese minorities will often have their own unique systems. Now, China is a very big place, though, so even when you speak about a minority, you would be talking about a very large group of people. One such minority are the Muslims, who today make up for over 20 million people. Nowadays, the majority of Muslims live peacefully among the other Chinese, but for many centuries, they had to protect their closed communities from outside threats. And to do this, they created several martial arts, which were essentially secret, as only the family and clan members were taught to them. Now, they did, however, keep their religion and martial arts separate. A notable characteristic of the Muslim martial arts in China is that their emphasis is on practical self-defense and effective combat, taking precedent over spirituality. Now initially, the martial arts created by the Chinese Muslims were mostly used to defend the community, teach physical exercise, and have a nice cultural common ground between people. But by the 1700s, these martial arts were being used for business as well. What kind of business? Mostly that of physical protection. You see, China of the 17th to the 19th centuries did not have what we know as a police force. And in fact, they didn't even have a mail or shipping service. So how did people send envelopes and packages? Well, you had to physically embark on a journey with the caravans to deliver things from point A to point B. Now, this was very dangerous as such caravan parties were easy prey for various gangs and thieves. So the insurance policy of the day was to hire tough and capable martial artists to escort your caravans. Now, this was good business for the Muslims and non-Muslim martial arts alike. Otherwise, for similar reasons, bodyguards were also in high demand all over. Now, one Muslim martial art which shone and stood out at the time in northern China was called Xini Lue Chuen. Over 250 years ago, it was already popular among the northern Chinese Muslims. Xini Lue Chuen was one of these martial arts which were used by the Chinese Muslims to fend for themselves and as bodyguards or caravan escorts. Over time, the secrets of this art spilled out though, and it arrived to the hands of the rich clan. Now this Chinese clan is called the Dai. They developed the art to their own tastes and understandings, creating their own branch of the style with its distinct flavor. 
The Dai clan kept their own traditional Xin Yin Lue Chuen to this day, being their family's treasure. Now their martial art is still alive and well, taught by many teachers in China and abroad. Now it was from the martial art of the Dai clan that the style known as Xin Yi Chuen eventually developed. So let's take a look at how that came to be. Around the year 1845, an outsider arrived at the village where the Dai clan resided. The stranger's name was Li. This man came to the Dai clan with the intention of learning their martial arts secrets, knowing that they had great martial arts and they were very successful with their business. Now the Dai clan was not enthusiastic about teaching the foreigner, to say the least. He was not of their clan or ethnicity and he came to them without any prior acquaintance or recommendations. But Li was very stubborn and he set up a shop in the village, growing and selling vegetables. Now Li already had a lot of martial arts experience prior to coming to live with the Dai clan and he was willing to bide his time and prove that he was worthy. After several years of this, Li warmed his way into the hearts of the locals and he was finally taught the Dai clan's interpretation of the art. Now after learning from the Dai clan for a number of years, Honored Farmer Li, as he was now called, traveled around northern China and he taught various groups of students. His interpretations of the art was now called Xin Yi Chuen, and from the various groups Li taught arose the various lineages and branches of this new martial art. And now this all happened roughly about 150 years ago. Xin Yi Chuen. Now, what does that even mean? The name is pretty interesting. Xin means shape any shape you can make, kind of like a baking mold which creates a shape. Yi means your mind's intention. So the name Xing Yi means to use your intention to create any shape you want. Now this martial art tries to teach people how to understand movement and fighting concepts so that they could mold their mind's intention into any shape. Meaning that no matter how you move or use your body, you can always apply the principles and make it work, either for combat or promoting one's own health. So that's the concept in a nutshell, and a deeper explanation would be a full discussion in its own right. Now the word Chuen simply means fist. It is common to put the word Chuen or fist at the end of names of Chinese martial arts, much like the Japanese will add the words Do or Jitsu for the names of their martial arts. Do means way, and Jitsu means technique or method. So Karate Do translates to way of the empty hand. Jiu Jitsu translates to gentle method or gentle technique. So with that being said, the name Xing Yi Chuen literally translates as the fist of the shape and the intention. Or if you want to get even more broad, you could say it stands for the fist method which allows you to use your tension to make any shape work. Now Xin Yi Chuen does not approach the learning curve like one would expect from Taekwondo, Karate, or Muay Thai. The people who historically studied this art were Chinese farmers. They were already strong, fit, and flexible from lifelong work in the fields. So, although the art does become very physically demanding, it does not begin at that point for the novice practitioner. It assumes that the person is either already versed in the martial arts or at least physically fit. What Xing Yi Chuen does instead is teach people the very basics of how to move the body very differently to what is normal and intuitive. So, first taught methods are called Jiang Zhuang. These are standing practices. You stand and hold one posture for prolonged periods of time, typically anywhere from 5 to even 60 minutes. Now such postures one holds are initially static, but over time they become very dynamic. These postures are used to teach internal body mechanics. The practitioner is gradually instructed how to move the body from the inside emanating from the core. Now the advanced result of this, after a decade or so of practice, can be that the body will move and behave like a miniature, vibrant, and powerful ocean, waving its flesh about with minute and subtle motions. Now depending on the lineage, there might be anywhere between 2 to 12 types of standing postures taught. And in fact, it can even be practiced sitting and laying down in bed if one is injured or sick. It is a form of internal practice which can be used to benefit health, fighting ability, or both. Now after Zhang Zhuang comes the walking practices and methods. These methods are often called plow stepping or mud stepping. They teach the practitioner to use special bodily skills and structure learned with Zhang Zhuang while you move around. Now this is an important part of the curriculum for beginners during the first two to three years of practice and it serves as a bridge between Zhang Zhuang and their fighting skills. The advanced version of walking methods is called chicken stepping. Chicken stepping teaches you how to rapidly advance and retreat in all directions. The idea is that each step is used to recycle the momentum of the previous one so that the whole body is continuously charged with kinetic energy, ready to explode at any moment. Now before we go any further, let's review some of the fundamentals about Chinese philosophy, medicine, and culture. Because without these fundamentals, Xing Yi Chuen would be very difficult to understand. 
Like any other internal martial art of China, Jing Yi Chuen has a strong connection with Taoism. The theories of yin yang, taiji, bagua, and others which are part of Taoism are commonly used in the language of these martial arts. Now in the episode What is Kung Fu, we went over the basis of the three main philosophies in the Chinese martial arts and their culture. So aside from Taoism, which we will cover in a minute, there is also Buddhism and Confucianism. Now I recommend checking the episode out for an overview and understanding of how they may overlap with each other as part of a person's beliefs. Now in Taoism there exists the idea of as above, so below. Taoism holds that the human body, for example, is a reflection of the heavens. So for instance, in Chinese medicine, there are 10 major internal organs and 12 main meridians. These are called the 10 celestial stems and the 12 earthly branches. Now this is all Taoist theory. The 10 celestial stems and 12 earthly branches are not solely the 10 internal organs or the 12 main meridians. They are thought to be the human embodiment of the five main planets that affect the earth and the 12 main constellations that we see in the sky. Now we said 10 celestial stems, but we only mentioned five planets. Well, that's because the so-called 10 celestial stems are made of both the yin and yang aspects of each five planets, so that brings the total to 10. Xing Yi Chuan is based on this Taoist theory. Its curriculum is structured around the 10 celestial stems and the 12 earthly branches via what are called the five phases and the 12 animals. Now let's break down how that philosophy applies. Everyone knows the game Rock, Paper, Scissors, right? Easy peasy. You've got three options, either creating or destroying the other. We all know the rules. Scissors cuts paper, paper covers rock, rock smashes scissors. Now, some people also know the more complex version of that game known as Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock. Now, many of you might have known this from the sitcom Big Bang Theory, but it was actually a game invented by Sam Cass and Karen Bryla prior to the show using it. Now in this version of the game, you have five options instead of three, and once more, each option is either created by or destroys the other. Now the five phases of Taoism and Xing Yi Chuan is very similar to the game of Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock. With the five phases of Taoism, we also have five options, and they can be many types of five things for example. The classic five phases, often mistakenly called the five elements, are metal, water, wood, fire, and earth. Metal creates water, Water destroys wood. Water creates wood and destroys fire. Wood creates fire and destroys earth. Fire creates earth and destroys metal, and so forth. But in fact, the five phases can be many groups of five. For instance, the five organ pairs of the body, the five major planets affecting the earth, the five senses, etc. It's in all these five groups that you have the similar dynamic of influence of creation and destruction, or some prefer to say creation and restraint. Now, when old farmer Lee created Xing Yi Chuan, he wisely used the same model. He picked five basic movements to serve as the base and basics for his entire martial art. Now, these five movements correspond to the five phases, and each either creates or restrains the other. These five movements are called Pi Chuan, Zhuan Chuan, Bong Chuan, Pao Chuan, and Hung Chuan. These are collectively called the Five Fists of Xing Yi Chuan. The Five Fists of Xing Yi Chuan uses the structure and internal methods from Zhang Zhuang, and the stepping skills that we discussed before to create the combative framework of the style. Now, these five fists can be practiced as single exercises or as solo practices or with partner talu. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what talu is, it is a very similar Chinese counterpart to kata, but with some distinctions. We also cover this topic in What is Kung Fu, and you can find a direct link to that section in the description below. So, this concludes part one of What is Ching Yi Chuan? In the next episode, we're going to take a dip into the training practices of the art and explore some of the movements and combative ideas that make Xing Yi Chuan what it is. Now, I would like again to extend my greatest gratitude and appreciation to Shifu Jonathan Bluestein for his role in this project. He provided us with the research and the script for me to present to all of you today. Shifu Bluestein is also the author of two great books on the martial arts, called The Research of the Martial Arts and The Martial Arts Teacher. Now, we've recommended these books before, and they're a really great read, if, and you can find them in the description below. He is also the headmaster of an international martial arts organization called Blue Jade. In Blue Jade International Schools is taught the art of Xing Yi Chuan alongside several other arts. To reach Shifu Bluestein, search for Shifu Jonathan Bluestein on Facebook or click the link in the description. For Blue Jade International Schools, we have a link for that below as well. Hey guys, don't forget to pick up your own Colors of Combat t-shirt. We've got a brand new collection, 22 designs over multiple different martial arts. That way you guys can wear your art with pride. It's a way for us to support the channel without resorting to sponsorships while you guys have some really cool souvenirs. So get your own now. Check out the link in the description, artofwindojo.com slash store. Hi everyone. Welcome back to Kung Fu, What is Xing Yi Chuan? 
Now this is part two of the series, so we have not yet seen the first one. Please be sure to go check that out as we talked about the history and development of the art that leads up to this point. Today we're going to get an introduction of the curriculum itself and see how a lot of the methods developed are applied in practice as we continue to explore the history of the fist of the shape and the intention. So stick around for the good stuff. In the previous video, we summarized the role that Taoism played in the art, particularly the concept of the 10 celestial stems and the 12 earthly branches. Xing Yi Chuan is based on this Taoist theory. Its curriculum is structured on the 10 celestial stems and 12 earthly branches via what are called the five phases and the 12 animals. Again, please check out the first video for more information on that. So what comes after the five phases or the five fists of Xing Yi Chuan? Now you might remember that the five fists stand to represent the 10 celestial stems. Now this leaves us with the 12 earthly branches. Now the representation of the 12 earthly branches comes to us in the form of 12 animals. These 12 animals are dragon, tiger, monkey, horse, alligator, rooster, swallow, sparrowhawk, snake, eagle, bear, and tai, which is a mythical bird. Now, are the 12 animals of Xingyi Chuan something like the animal systems of Kung Fu that you need to learn? Mm, not exactly. The different animals are either combinations of movements, or Tao Lu, and typically each animal has several of these combinations or forms. For each of these animal combinations or forms, there are of course numerous ways to apply them in combat. Interestingly, every lineage of the art also tends to feature small or even possibly major modifications for the animal movements, and it is common to find variations among schools and teachers. The animals of Xing Yi Chuan also use the mechanics of the five fists in novel and interesting ways. Now just to reiterate, the five fists or five movements are Pi Chuan, Zhuan Chuan, Bong Chuan, Pao Chuan, and Hung Chuan. The five fists laid a foundation for the techniques and body methods whose more advanced versions are studied through the animals. Now, the idea is not to make oneself appear like the animals. This is not an animal mimicking martial art. The concept of having the animals in the system is for the practitioner to borrow two things from them. First, their specific fighting spirit, and second, their strategies and tactics. The practitioner is supposed to adopt the psychological framework of the animal and adapt its unique way of moving for human combat. Now, here's just a few examples of some of the animal concepts. The monkey is quite agile, quick, and sneaky. It presents you with a facade and then seemingly randomly goes in another direction. The monkey is therefore unpredictable and playful, with arguably even itself not knowing where it may come next, but it easily adapts once it does. The monkey is light rather than heavy, fleeting rather than committed, and it uses the opponent like a branch to hang on to and thus turns itself into a weight which the opponent is forced to carry. It also prefers using open palm heel strikes over fists. The rooster is direct and unrelenting, attacking continuously without retreat, but forcing itself through openings rather than via brute force. It is vicious and it does not surrender. It has the characteristic of sharp pecking through penetrating action, and its beak is the phoenix eye fist. The rooster can also suddenly and violently flap its wings, causing the opponent to lose his footing. Its strength is found in its courage and intensity, more so than its physical prowess. The alligator is a heavy beast, which sways from side to side as it advances. It waves its massive tail left and right, and it can slam into somebody causing massive damage. The alligator can also bite or grab into someone with its mouth, and it aggressively pull them sideways and break them apart. It is powerful and oppressive, but it achieves its goals by adhering to circular movements and the acceleration of its own weight horizontally to drag down and drown his opponent. It also preserves conserving energy, only exploding when the timing is right. The swallow has the characteristic of soaring and then diving. While it soars, it is totally committed upwards. When it dives, it turns sideways. The swallow then goes up and down, swiftly changing direction. As it dives, it reaches between passageways, like walls and trees, spiraling among them. In Xing Yi Chuan, the trajectory of the flight pathways of the swallow have therefore been adapted for upward drilling movements aimed at the head and lowering of the body to topple the opponent. Swallow movements may also incorporate jumping forward into a sideways takedown and borrowing from this animal's character. Mm -hmm. 
Now, apart from the five fists and the animals, there are also various talu for solo and partner practice. Now, talu is sort of the equivalent of kata and karate, but with some distinctions. And we talked about this more in depth in what is kung fu, which you can find above or in the link below in the description. Now, these talu tend to tackle a very specific topic. Some will focus on connecting all the five fists and adding some combinations to them. Others link up together all the animal movements. There are even forms which combine the entire curriculum into a single, well-organized choreography. Though the talu may differ between lineages, typically there are at least four of the five of them in each school. Some forms are even specifically designed to bridge the gap between cooperative partner practice and full-blown sparring. Though the main emphasis on Ching Chuen is the practice of single movements and single combination, forms are still important, especially for beginners and intermediate practitioners. Accompanying the forms are various partner drills, which are semi-cooperative or freestyle, culminating into full sparring, traditionally without protective equipment. Now the method for developing whole body sensitivity through partner grappling is called rolling hands, as opposed to the pushing hands of Tai Chi Chuen or other arts. It is an effective measure of learning how to transition between both grappling and striking movements, and rather than being technique oriented, rolling hands thus teach the movement mechanism which are taught between techniques. The art and its unique outlook are further explored with the practice of weaponry. Chief among them is the big spear. So for training purposes, such giant spears can be three to five meters long, and they're usually made from a flexible white waxwood. The spear is important for learning how to generate the art's famous and formidable vibrating power, connect the entire body as a single unit, and guide movements with one's dan tian, or energy center. Other weapons vary between lineages, and they might include staves, swords, or specialized daggers. The spear is the most important weapon because the mechanics used to wield it are used in all the five phases and 12 animals. Many are of the opinion that the primary inspiration of creating Ching Yi Chuen was the use of the spear. A common mistake uttered by many is calling Ching Yi Chuen a linear art. That cannot be further from the truth. Now, while it is true that Xing Yi Chuen prefers a straightforward manner of attacking, as well as using narrow steps and postures, it is not all linear. Proper traditional Xing Yi Chuen contains small circles and spirals in every single movement. Such minute articulations of the body might be large, but they're often minuscule and undetectable to inexperienced observers. They cannot be understood and put to use unless much time is invested in the practice of single movements and Zhang Jiang. Using these tight circles and spirals allows the seasoned practitioner to either control the opponent or slide past his defenses. To the opponent though, these mechanics feel like a strong force or vibration. Now fighting in Xing Yi Chuen exemplifies two Chinese idioms. The first is that one should do combat like he is on fire, and the second one is fight the opponent attempting to wear him like a shirt. When a person is on fire, he tends to run amok and get through any person and obstacle in his path. Trying to wear the opponent like a shirt is a metaphor for feeling the enemy as being pliable in your hands, something you can rip apart, manipulate, and draw very close to your body while still maintaining control. Now this is all different from sports fighting in which there's often the touch and go dynamic or a play of giving and receiving. Xing Yi Chuen, being oriented towards self-defense rather than sport, strives to engage the opponent with a continuous committed flow and barrage of blows until either winning or survival of the encounter is achieved. Xing Yi Chuen is furthermore famous for its shocking explosive power, which can be used from short or long range alike. This type of method is called power emitting, or fa jin, in the Chinese language. Only quality traditional instruction will lead to the development of such power. To have the ability to fa jin means that the practitioner can put power into a technique without the need for withdrawing the arm or foot back to gather extra momentum. Now, as we all know, and those of you who fight, this can be very, very useful when every second counts. So this concludes our series on Kung Fu, what is Xing Yi Chuen. Now, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and please feel free to share your thoughts and experience in the comments, but please try to do so respectfully. Now, there's so much more we could talk about in this art, but we've got a lot more martial arts topics to cover as well. And for those of you who enjoy this and wish to learn more, should find a qualified teacher and seek hands-on instruction. And as before, I would like to give my extreme thanks to Shifu Jonathan Bluestein for providing us with the research and the narrative in both of these episodes so that we can present them to you today. His contribution is valuable and very much appreciated. Shifu Bluestein is also the author of two great books on the martial arts called Research of the Martial Arts and The Martial Arts Teacher, and you can find a link to them both in the video description. Now, he's also the headmaster of an international martial arts organization called Blue Jade. 
Now, in Blue Jade International Schools is taught the art of Xingyi Chuen alongside several other arts. To reach Shifu Blue Scene, search for Shifu Jonathan Blue Scene on Facebook, or you can click the link in the description. And as for Blue Jade International Schools, we also have a link for that as well. First and foremost, I would like to extend a great big thank you to good friend Seafood Jonathan Bluestein, you know, for his writing efforts and his, his providing footage for this episode. We really appreciated working together with him. It was a great experience overall, so I can't thank him enough for his contributions to this episode. And this was the first episode that we really looked deeply into a Chinese martial art. You know, I don't have as much experience in Chinese martial arts as I do as the Japanese and the American arts. So this was a very big eye-opening experience for me personally because what I really found... Um, to be a defining feature of a lot of these Chinese martial arts is just how old they are and how far back they go to the point where a lot of these arts go back so far that even their origin can sometimes be contested and even in debate where it's to the point where it's best guess theory. And you don't see a lot of that in the Okinawan arts, the Japanese arts, and the more contemporary American arts because, you know, history has been around long enough. It's recorded and the lineages are more clear. When you're talking about arts that could go back hundreds and maybe in some cases thousands of years old, you know, there wasn't as much as, you know, recorded written records. So it's a little bit harder to determine the origin. So a lot of times in this place, myths come up or folklore comes up. You know, sometimes it's true. Sometimes there's element of truth. Sometimes it's completely fabricated. There were elements of this episode. You know, when we were doing preliminary research, um, I know that there were some legends of the Yellow Emperor that had come up that, you know, there's the mythology around that. And, and Jonathan Bluestein was basically telling me, like, no, let's leave that out because it's really not pertinent to the information. So there's a lot of folklore out there that I find fascinating because the, the martial arts have been around for so long that sometimes this folklore gets embedded. And we don't see that in a lot of contemporary arts. So it becomes sort of its own mythology and kind of interwe uh, interweaves itself in with the culture of the art. So I think that adds a lot of color, even if you have to kind of take a mindset of um, trying to separate facts from fiction just having that color and flavor and and cultural impact in there you know i think adds a lot to to the romanticism of the martial arts now what's really cool too is looking back at this episode i'm on my own personal journey with kempo you know i'm looking back at my own material i'm trying to determine where i want to kind of set my focus of study and a lot of it is my desire to take a lot of the academic side of Kempo which is immense and it's deep and it's robust but I'm, I'm trying to bring a lot of that academic stuff to the surface and taking it and saying okay well now that we're learning XYZ how do you apply it in a real situation how do you apply it you know in any given scenario and looking at this episode I see there's a lot of concepts that I like that intrigue me enough that could possibly overlap that I could actually bring into my own Kempo training. And part of that is looking at the art's name, Xing Yi. Xing means shape, and Yi means mind's intention. So basically, you're literally taking the shape of your mind's intention. And I think as a concept, that can apply to just about any art across the board. But how would I apply that to Kempo? Well, the first thing is I would have to look at is watching this again is the whole concept of the Zhang Zhang, those mi little minute details and those core movements that you practice over a slow amount of time, and you really make yourself cognizant and aware, and, and you just pay a close mind attention to each individual m m the minutia of the, your movements because over time you can train your body to move in a bunch of different ways and I like this concept because this is part of one area I'm studying myself is you know when you add you know Kempo power principles we you know we have a lot of torque we have a lot of rotation and I've been trying to break this down into my own personal study of further action where it's not just you know rotating into the hips you've got you know you're pivoting on the balls of your feet you've got your knees you've got your hips you've got your waist but you also have rotations in your shoulder your elbow your wrist everything works together and i'm finding this to be a very good drill to stop and slow down and breathe and slowly go through the motions and like pay close attention to the individual rotations now in, in xing yi when they do this drill you know they spend hours you know just focusing on these core movements these internal very intense basic core movements and i think that that approach could work for a lot of arts if you're trying to fine tune something if you're even trying to hone into something in my case i am trying to sharpen and tighten a little bit of my my and put some compactness into some of my strikes. And my personal opinion is I can do that by focusing on the individual parts of my body that are rotating and finding that synchronicity in, in terms of the timing and the striking and the energy. And a drill like this, I think, would be incredibly beneficial for me to carry over the tempo. You know, I'm not doing the same rotations, the same movements, but I can apply the mindset to the movements we do have. So I can take my time, I can breathe, and not worry about actually striking the pad or actually delivering the move, but just focus on my rotation and movement so that was a big part that's kind of stood out to me rewatching this again i'm thinking 
that's that's a great concept, you know. That's definitely something I could carry over, and it's definitely something a lot of you could carry over into your arts too. If you wanted to break down the minutia of specific movements, you know, spend some time. Wing Chun is a master of this. They spend a lot of time on the basic movements to get it down and make it like natural. And I think that is an excellent way to train and an excellent method to implement into your own studies. And I also like the way the animals are implemented. You know, a lot of Kung Fu systems, you know, they're animal based. You hear this a lot, you know, crane, snake, you know, you hear these styles of Kung Fu. I like in, in, in the context of Xing Yi that it's not necessarily a whole system based on an animal. Rather, they're taking a whole bunch of animals and they're looking at specific attributes as inspiration. And they're thinking, hmm, how can this context work, you know, I I apply to these motions? You know, like the alligator, for example, using its weight. And everybody's got a different build. And I do believe that by studying some of these attributes that you could take those attributes and, and take your body mass and your building your structure and find out what works for you. In my case, I think I'm, I'm particularly drawn to the monkey and the alligator style that was kind of talked about in this video. The monkey, um, you know, focuses on, on sneakier strikes and, and it grabs and holds on to the opponent and that you make them bear your own weight and also a lot of open hand strikes. Um, these are things I'm personally a fan of. I, I do have mass. I do have weight and I do try to use it in sparring. A lot of times if a jab comes in, I'll try to trap or I will hook and I'll pull down, but I'll try to use my weight. And I also try to, you know, use my weight as sort of a disruption to their balance. And the open hand strikes are great. You know, palm heels to the side of the head, a lot of, you know, palm heel strikes and hooking. So I kind of think there's elements of that conceptually that I could bring into my own tempo, thinking that, you know, that mentality of, you know, moving like the monkey, sneaky attacks, making them bear my own weight. The alligator is definitely a heavy beast, and I like how it describes that it uses its body to slam to its opponent, and it grabs, it tears, it rips, it pulls. That's definitely, in at least in my head, where a lot of my fighting mechanics are. Again, I'm a bigger guy. I do use my weight. You know, I, you know, there's a joke in sparring. They call me the wall because I, I am big, but I'm also solid and I'm also able to brace myself. So when I take a hit, even if I take the hit, they're bouncing off of me. So I've got that weight that I can actually use into them. And I've even had instructors tell me, use my weight and my mass to my advantage. If I can get in close to them and get my hands on them, it's overwhelming. And especially if I can do the grabbing and the pulling and the disruption. And that's where like a lot of the judo and, and jujitsu training comes in from and a lot of the takedowns and twisting I mean, and Campbell's really good close range with the hands so I kind of like I like the concept of myself adopting the monkey style and the alligator style the kind of modifying it and bringing it into my own training of Kempo. And this even goes the same with the rolling hand concepts, like the whole, the, the grappling that they have, where you, you know, these hand drills, when once you make contact, you go, you roll from, you know, grappling techniques to strike techniques. I'm really big into that. Kempo already has its own version of sticky hands, and it's not like, it's not like Chi Sao, it's not, or it's not quite the same, but it's a very similar concept of once you make contact with your opponent, you should be able to feel their movement, anticipate their reaction, ride with it, and transition from, from breaks and strikes and parry and grabs and grappling and back and forth keep it free flowing i do love that concept so and that is something i'm working on as well so when i take a step back and i look at the big picture and i see that you know xing yishuan is focusing on x y and z i look at these attributes i'm like you know this this commonality here between a lot of the different arts and i think there's a lot of things we could cherry pick conceptually wise and take out of the context of one art and go to your art, whether it be BJJ or boxing or Muay Thai or Taekwondo or whatever your art is, I think it's a healthy practice to look at elements of other arts. Even if you don't agree with how the art trains or you don't like the art to begin with, there's got to be a nugget in there somewhere that you can take and adapt. There's got to be something where you go, hmm, okay, not a bad idea. Take it, test it, modify it, put it into your own into your own regimen, and see what you can do with it. I think that is one of the best things the martial arts have to offer is that there's so many flavors Make your own recipe, you know, try things out. That's definitely what I'm doing, and I'm having a blast personally. And I just want to say again that this was a fantastic experience. This was a really eye-opening and educational project for me. And I really thank uh, uh, Seafood Jonathan Blue Scene so much for your help with this collaboration. It was a great experience. And if you guys are interested, I definitely recommend his books. He's got a lot of great insight. You know, he's he, he's got his website, thebluejadesociety.com. Check it out. Get his books. He's a wonderful scholar, a wonderful gentleman, very, very insightful and knowledgeable. And I just thank him so much for being my friend and for helping us out with this episode. And I hope that this compilation brings this content to more eyes because i do think you know we need to make the effort to get it out there and if you like these history episodes i'm going to invite you to check out our playlist we have a whole bunch you know we've done shotokan we've done kyokushin we've done even bujikan american kempo we've looked at a bunch of different arts so you can check out our playlist right here there's a lot to chew on for all you history buffs out there and to let us know 
any history arts or any art history that you'd like us to delve into because we're always looking for more content. We're always looking to expand. And as always, we thank you so much for your viewership and we hope you all have a wonderful day.